So yeah, I'm really happy that Christine ended with a, a quote by Schiller and the question of how is it that art can uh, allow us to break out of our false conditioning? How, how is it that the, the sensual world that we live in, and we all do live in a very sensual world of consumerism, of geopolitics, uh, hyper-materialism, and we were sort of, we were born into this process. And so there, a lot of the, the neurotic disor disorders that that system demands on society are on some level within all of the people who were born into it and live within it, within different levels. Now when you become self-conscious of these problems and you start getting an idea of what a positive natural law is, what a, what a positive natural creative human being is, it, it gives us, it affords us all sorts of opportunities to not fall for the, the traps that the system has, has placed in our lives and allows us a chance to actually bring about what Schiller calls this ideal within all of us, that every human being, by virtue of being made in the image of God, has a divine spark, which is an ideal, and that when we become conscious of it, we can constantly perfect our lives towards uh, embodying that ideal without ever having reached that, that limit. There's no end point to the ability or a power of self-perfectability, and that's a very important concept in Schiller's world, which was shared by Plato and many of the great uh, humanist thinkers of our, of our lives. Um, the, the irony that I enjoy um, in this title is that one would think on, on the surface that painting is something which is, by, by its nature, sensual. Right? It's, it's based on color, tones, pigments, paint. It's, it's, it's your painting, you know, things, objects, feelings. Um, so how is it that such a such a thing could allow us to be liberated from the belief in our senses and all of the passions that emanate from the sensual part of us, which sometimes, as we saw in the case of uh, the character of Hamlet on the stage, will cause great tragedy not just to ourselves, but to those around us, and undo a lot of good potential that could happen if we don't think on a higher level. And uh, I was given advice a long time ago that whenever you should start a presentation, it's always a good idea to try to start with a joke. Okay. You guys heard this, this advice, right? It loosens, up, loosens people up, gets, a, gets everybody to a more comfortable mindset. Um, so I thought of a joke, and um, Vermeer is a really good joke teller. I don't know if you guys uh, know Vermeer. So I figured I'd start with a, a, a joke that Vermeer told a long time ago, okay? You guys ready for it? On the screen. On the screen? Okay, I wish I could make it bigger. All right, so this is a joke by Vermeer. Uh -huh. It's a joke without words. Anybody, uh? A joke by who? Vermeer. He's a, a Dutch painter in the 17th century. Anybody, uh, what do people think? Do, do people get the idea of where the joke might, might exist? Or how, how he's telling the joke? Because he does, he does plant a punchline in here. Can we maybe have a close-up because I'm not too sure you what... You might have to come closer to me. Yeah. Okay. What's the guy yeah. there? Huh? Yeah. Well, what, what's happening here? What, what's, what's occurring in this uh, image? There's a painter painting a woman. Yeah, a painter painting, painting a woman. Okay. Here, and somebody is looking painting. through a curtain. Yes, yeah, somebody's holding open the curtain and walking in on a painter painting. It's called the artist studio. Yeah. That's actually... They, people say that that is actually Vermeer painting himself, painting his model. Okay, what else? What else do you, do you see? Okay. Yeah, you might have to move a little bit closer. What's the What's the model doing? She's holding a book. She's holding a book. And what else is she holding? A trumpet. A trumpet. She's holding a book and a trumpet. Does she look like she's holding very? I mean, books back then were very dense. That's a big book. Mm -hmm. It's probably like a good eight pounds of book. Yeah. And a trumpet's not light. She's Usually made of brass. Huh? She's very strong. She's very strong. She must be very strong. Yeah. Does anybody know how long it takes to paint in oil paints with a live model in front of you? Patrick Sear knows. A few days. Long time. <laughs> very patient process. <laughs> does she look like she's straining a lot? Or does she look very graceful and, and calm? Very graceful. Very graceful, as if she wasn't holding anything. Okay. I'm not going to say anymore. Anybody have a clue where the joke might exist? Just making the uh, the joke that when we see pictures, we might think that when they were making the pictures, that people are actually standing there, not moving while he was doing the picture. 
Sometimes they did that. But, but that's not really the joke. Okay. What's he painting? Flower? Her hat. Hmm? It looks like a flower or, or her hat. Her hat. That's what would be cursed, though. Hmm. He's painting her hat. So she's a mother. So she's holding all that? Um, For nothing. Uh, <laughs> 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 I basically said so for nothing. Okay. Uh, either he's totally sadistic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, or there's actually something funny built into that. I don't think Ramirez is a sadist. Mm -hmm. We just torture his models. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he's painting the feathers on her hat. Or it's going to be a very long time, many hours from that point, that he'll actually get around to painting the trumpet and the rest of her body. <laughs> so, like right now, she wouldn't even need to be able to build as well as painting. No, no, not at all. He doesn't even need to have her there right now for a hat. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, this is not the most revolutionary, moralizing picture in the world, but I think it gets us into the, the right mindset that I, I was hoping that we'd all be able to step into as we begin this exploration. Um, because really there is something very important that Schiller is de devoting his life to as an artist, a poet, a, a playwright, um, whose thoughts shaped whole generations of, of scientific discoveries. Uh, after he died. Um, in every single, not a single field of human knowledge was not improved upon immensely by Schiller's thoughts. And in the aesthetical letters that some of us here have had a chance to read through over the past few months, and, and currently still are reading through um, on Sundays, uh, he, he immediately got at the point that there's a certain idea of art, a certain quality of art that we should aspire to both as artists and as citizens who want to select which art we allow into our soul. Because obviously there's a whole variety of art, and that's our choice to decide what is it that we, we shape ourselves with, that what type of culture do we choose to imbue ourselves with. And he says here, the second letter, is it not somewhat untimely to seek a code of law for the aesthetic world, while the affairs of the moral world raise matters of much more direct interest, and the spirit of philosophical inquiry is expressly challenged by the present circumstances to address the most perfect of all works of art, the construction of political liberty. So he's actually saying that the idea of politics and liberty is the highest of all of the arts. Mm -hmm. And that's a big, tall order to get across. Um, and uh, just to say one thing in, in that, the context you got to keep in mind, he's looking at a world of high revolutionary fervor. Right, the, the spirit of the American Revolution had spread across Europe. You had the French Revolution, which he was writing this at the point that the hope of it working out in France had just about died at, at that moment in 1792-93. Um, all of the positive potential had, had gone to hell. And he basically diagnosed this in a certain way, where he, he made the point that the problem of France that wasn't the problem in America was that in France, the aristocracy had become so in their own minds, they had been so stuck in their own ideological, abstract world outside of material reality that they couldn't understand what the people wanted. They didn't understand how to empathize with the people or love the people. And the people, the problem is that they didn't have access to any culture or proper education for the most part. So you had a people in want whose passions and identities were shaped by ab the absence of food, the absence of hope, right? And so that created this mob of, of anger and rage that was easily redirected towards just dis killing and destroying everything that seemed and smelled like establishment at a certain point when times were ripe. And so he said the, the objective conditions for revolution and creating a better society of republics was there, but the subjective conditions culturally was lacking. Mm -hmm. And it's both the failure of the leadership and the failure of the people as a whole. And, you know, he says the, the problem is when, when you have such a, prop, a, a situation as we often have in our society right now, Right? There's, where do you find the hope? If the leadership is, is, is fail, has failed and the people have failed, where is there going to be hope for, for a better course of action? Only with the wolf. <laughs> Easy answer to everything. <laughs> um, no, but this is where he says the role of the artist. And LaRouche often says this all the time. This is why we need to cultivate uh, a higher standard of arts. Because the artist can bring in an idea uh, they can allow people to see themselves that 
in a way that they would never accept to be seen by somebody just condemning them or, or lecturing at them. As we saw with, with Schilling's, uh, <laughs> Schilling, uh, Christine's <laughs> presentation of, of Shakespeare's uh, Hamlet. And this, the artist, if he's going to do this or she's going to do this properly, has to take into consideration the, the two aspects of the human condition, the immortal, the infinite, the part of us that can access ideas like freedom that are not subject to the same boundary conditions as this material bottle in front of me, right? Freedom is not something you can put in your pocket, nor is justice or the good or beauty or truth. These are ideas that are unbounded, but then you have the boundary world. And so Schiller says in letter 13, at first glance, nothing seems to be more contradictory than the tendencies of these two impulses, the one striving for change and the other for immut immutability. So one part of us is always yearning for change, one part for, for fixedness, for self-preservation, one for always improving, one for existing. And he says, he goes on in that same thought to say, nonetheless, it is these two impulses that exhaust the concept of humanity. Right? And a third basic impulse that could reconcile the two is quite simply unthinkable. How can we then restore the unity of human nature, which seems to have been shattered by this original and radical contradiction? And that's a big question, right? What else, what else is there? How does the artist actually create uh, something other than these two extremes that would allow us to resolve this? And since we're living in the modern era, in the world that we're living in, I figured we could look at a couple of examples of art that um, we can encounter popularly around us, which doesn't do that. Let's stop. So here. Here's a couple of examples when you don't make that reconciliation, what happens? <laughs> Anybody know who this is? Who, who painted this? Yeah. No. No? Okay. It's it. Scott? No. <laughs> Alright, this is, this is a painting done in 1956, as you can see the title, very, very profound title, Orange and Yellow, <laughs> painted by one Mark Rothko. Mm -hmm. Mark Rothko is, uh, it's funny that people don't really know him, but he's actually the the modern artist which, whose paintings have sold for the highest price of all other paintings. This one actually sold in 2015 for the price of $400 million. Oh my god. Yes. I, I have it at home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you're, you're the cause of the camera society. I did. <laughs> I have. Yeah. You dropped off of the Hangouts call somewhere. I dropped off the Hangouts calls? Well, that's, that's unfortunate. Um, okay, so this is what happens when you don't bridge the gap, okay? You have the objective, you've, you've got this objective idea of truth that's accessible to the mind and ideas, and then you've got this internal world of the senses, of our feelings, that's completely detached from any objectivity. And when you don't find this third way, like Schiller says, um, this third basic impulse that could reconcile the two, while not negating the two, you get certain results, of which we have things like this, which is abstract and expressionism, as they call it, in the art world, uh, but of a passive sort, because you just sort of meditate, there's no action in that. Um, then you have the uh, abstract expressionism on the opposite extreme, that is also big in the art, art world today, of uh, Jackson Pollock. Mm -hmm. um, that's something which is also sold for over $100 million, called Convergence. And uh, you have Surrealism. The, the School of Surrealism. This is probably P uh, Pablo Picasso's best piece of work called Guernica from 1936, which is actually, you know, he's, he's attempted to do, to do something uh, noble. He's expressing something intelligible on, on one level, which is one of the few times he does this. Okay. All right. So, um, all right. So the question is, do these, these things, in what way do they uh, adhere to the Schillerian ideal? Do they increase our political freedom or not? And a lot of people would say, well, that's, that's insulting. Art is not supposed to have a purpose. It's not supposed to increase freedom in any way, especially not supposed to be political. And one could say in response to that, well, these things actually wouldn't be popular. They wouldn't have value in our society unless there was political agendas to promote that um, for many decades. And in fact, as it's come out uh, in the 90s, all of these things from Jackson Pollock to Mark Rothko and many others uh, throughout the 1950s and 60s were sponsored by the CIA and the Congress for Cultural Freedom. So, in Come fact, no, society... Come this. Huh? Come this. Yeah, right. 
Uh, this, is, this stuff has been completely admitted by the CIA, and, and they justify it by saying, no, they had to. They had to fight communism. They had to fight fascism. Mm. And so this is the way that modern Western democracy preserved itself and the, the respect for individuality, which is what's supposed to define us as, opposed, as different from communism. Because mm. in the communist world, that's where you have classical realism. Mm. Things like, like this. And any time we let anything like that in, that is the corruption of our society. You guys know who these people are on the screen? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so what, like what, 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 right. what was that? The one at right. I like them. So what ideas are the art, is the artist trying to communicate in both of these cases? In Soviet Russia, in the case of Lenin, or in the case of Mao? What, what, is it, what does he want to communicate? It's not a trick question. It's a uh, color theme is similar. Yeah, color theme is similar, red, visceral, yeah, sure, revolution. Unity. Unity in the people, yeah. Like lighting up the, the way. Yeah. Who's going to light up the way for you? The common man. The common man being support, supported, or supporting who? The, 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 the leaders. The leader, right? Yeah. Lenin and Mao are awesome. <laughs> to the degree that we rally around the leader, we the common people will uh, have our freedom, whatever. So this is like two extremes of what happens when your society doesn't resolve that, 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 um, that discrepancy between idealism and, 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 and the internal tastes and feelings that every, every human being has as a unique individual. Um, we're going to do something a little bit uh, interesting right now because neither one Schiller would call art. And in describing this third instinct, he gets at it in so many different ways throughout all of his writings. In letter 15 of the Aesthetical Letters, he starts getting at it in a, he starts fleshing it out. And he says here, the object of the sensuous instinct. So he says we have both the sensuous instincts as well as the rational instincts, right? Yearnings from both of those domains. Uh, the object of the sensuous, expressed in a universal concept, is life in the broadest meaning. A concept which means all material being and everything immediately present in the senses. This makes sense because without life, you wouldn't have perceptions. Senses have a reason to be. There's a reason why we feel pain, pleasure, and the, these different senses were developed in the universe because living life required it to have embodiment, to not just be this ephemeral, disembodied idea floating there. So okay, life is the broadest meaning. The object of the formal instinct expressed in a universal concept is form, not only in the figurative, but also in the literal meaning. A concept which includes within itself all formal qualities of things and all relations of the same to the thinking powers. So form, when he's talking about the, pl the platonic form, right? It's not like you have an idea of the circle and that's why the circle exists, it, right? It's not like you have an idea of justice and that's why justice exists. One would say, no, justice exists, circles exist as a part of the universe. And the fact that we have ideas of them, we can conceptualize them and improve our concepts is the reason why we, we have a mind to think. So, unless you're a radical empiricist, then you would say the universe, is, or an existentialist, then you might say the universe is just a, an illusion that's purely subjective to you and doesn't exist to anybody but you, and there's no meaning beyond that. So that's what, that's what a Picasso might say and does say. Um, Schiller says no. So you, you have these two aspects, these two formal and sensual instincts, and he says the object of the object of the play instinct, represented in a universal scheme, will therefore be able to be called living form, a concept which serves to designate all aesthetical qualities of phenomena, and in a, in a word, what one calls beauty in the broadest meaning. So there's a living form now. If we want to get it a, uni a, a way to unify them, there's something playful that he's getting at as a play instinct, and something as a living form that unites both worlds that we have to work with. And I just want to like give the most quick, quick example as a comparison of, of the of the living form. Here's the same subject conveyed by two artists. Okay, one a medieval artist, name unknown, conveying an image which people are probably familiar with of Mary and, and baby Jesus. Okay, this is a medieval drawing pre-Renaissance. 
kind of creepy. Yeah. Kind of creepy. Mm. Does it make you feel anything mm. particularly special or divine? No. Dark. Dark, yeah. A little dark, a little weird. Yeah, a little distinct. <laughs> Hard to yeah. identify with. Uh, here's something a little bit more contempor contemporary in the 19th century. Same subject matter. All right. Mary, Mary and Jesus. It's pretty obvious that there's something here that this art artist was tapping into that awakens a certain uh, spectrum of emotion that wasn't there in the previous one. So you have the form, you have a higher divine idea, but it's being expressed in a way that you can actually identify with it. There's some emotion attached to it that's real. Oh, you made it back. Yeah. That was good. Now got past it. Okay. <coughs> oh, good. Uh, that's a that's a metaphor for the the lamb dog, the lamb of God. Scapegoat. What? Scapegoat. Scapegoat. The book in the I don't think it has the same meaning. Scapegoat. No. No, I think it's a reference to the lamb of God. Yeah. So that's that's the quickest, just the basic example of an, one small expression of the living form. Um. I'm going to go for something a little bit more advanced now, okay? We're taking, we're just going at this in, in gradations. I'm going to take two paintings that were successful in what they set out to do. One paint, and they have the same subject matter. One painting has something that the other doesn't, and we're going to look at both of them, okay? This is the Agnew Clinic, painted by a very, very good, talented American painter named Thomas Eakins in 1889. Okay. Everyone can see that? Mm -hmm. I really wish I could make this full screen. I don't want to risk it again. Uh, okay. <clears throat> this is Rembrandt van Rins, 1666, The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Tolp. Okay, Eakin's Agony Clinic. Dr. Tolp's Anatomy Lesson. Same subject matter, right? Mm -hmm. What do you guys think that this one is really about. What it, do you think that that's an, an, a truthful uh, title to give this painting? What is the painter seeking to display to his audience who are going to be looking at the painting? Well, at first we can maybe look at the differences and similarities. Uh, for me, at least, uh, the, the similarity is, number one, they're operating on, on, on a patient, a patient, a subject. Yeah. Uh, they have an audience, but the audience is, is kind of different. This, in the second painting, Rembrandt's audience is much smaller, mm -hmm. much closer to the act itself, much more curious, much more engaged, let's say. Uh, the second one, they're just fuzzy, they're in the background. You can see them, they're interested, but I don't know. It's, uh, they're not really there, but there, in a sense. Um, I think that they are there. I would ask you, though, when you said that the audience here is more engaged in what the, uh, the teacher is teaching, mm -hmm. yeah. Is that true? Are they really? I mean, how many of them are actually looking at what the teacher is doing? I mean, I see one, two, three, four, Most five, six, seven students. How many of them are actually looking and paying attention to the teacher? I don't know, from, from here, I, 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 Come closer. Yeah, that's mine. Guys, throw, throw, out, throw out things fast. Yeah. How many how many people are actually looking at the teacher? For me, it's all of them. Yeah, everyone. No, uh, everyone's know. looking. Uh, they look at the, what he's doing. Yeah, who, who's looking at what he's doing? Two of them. Two of them. Yeah. Three. That that one is mid, the middle and the one Just above. Just be it. careful of the camera. Okay. But the rest of the that one. Yeah, yeah, they're looking at his hands. The others are looking at his face. Yeah, I think these three. Yeah. These, this one's looking at what he's doing. This one's probably looking at what he's doing, or maybe the, the face. I'm not sure. This one's definitely looking at his face. Yeah. What about the other ones? They're also looking at. What's well, this guy doing? They're looking at us. Looking at us. Us. What's this guy doing? Us. They're looking at us. This guy's turning around, looking at something, right? Yeah. Okay. So they're actually, they're not actually paying as much attention as you think. Something just happened. Something just happened in that scenario. What just happened? It, what's this moment capturing? But this, this person just look, he's, he's just looking over his, his neck. Uh, Somebody came. Us, right? Well, I would Which say, from what I'm looking at, there's a book in the corner. There's a book um, in the corner. And maybe 
Okay. You know, if I were to infer from the scene, following then, the yeah, following in the text, maybe what has been written before, and then looking yeah. at the actual. If anatomy. you actually look at where their eyes are pointing, though, they're not looking at the text. This guy is right. He is he is looking. His eyes are looked directly at the spectator, and so is this guy, mm -hmm. and so is this guy. They're not looking at that book. Mm -hmm. So what just happened? So we're joining joining them. We just walked in. <laughs> we just walked in. Because if we were already there for a while, all of them would probably have been looking at us or looking away from us. But the fact that some of them are still looking at what's going on, and a few of them just noticed us, it's the moment that we just walked in. So what's the subject of this painting? Is nobody here is looking at us. Right? The subject is exactly what it intends to be. The right? doctor. Yeah. The guy has left. Yeah. It's the process of teaching, of science, of medical science. Very good. Worthwhile subject to, to popularize and make beautiful. That's what it is. This one is a little bit more playful. Because all of a sudden, the subject isn't actually in any of the figures that we're looking at sensually. Eh? So it's us. <laughs> the subject is actually us. Us in a process of doing something. <clears throat> and it's that moment of change which makes Rembrandt very unique. And when you look at Rembrandt's paintings from that perspective, looking for it, you find it everywhere. Mm -hmm. But yet the mind has to be sort of tuned to look for it to see it. Mm -hmm. And he plants these things everywhere. Vermeer does it less, but still does it. Um, let's take it to another level, okay? So, there's a follower of Rembrandt in, uh, in Spain, working for uh, King Philip IV. And uh, this is in the, co the context of King Philip IV is, is not a great king. This is a guy who ran the, the Thirty Years' War. He, a lot of damage was done to the people of the Netherlands, uh, of, uh, the Flemish especially, uh, under the course of the, the Habsburg and the, and the Spanish empires. This king had a, a, a painter in his court who was a big fan of, of Rembrandt. And this name, his name was Velázquez. Velázquez is somebody we're going to look at because he does something in many of his works that I find very unique, um, especially in a, at a particular court painting of the court family, the royal family, which we're going to take a moment to, to investigate. Up until then, and even after, after Velázquez's famous painting that I'm going to look at called La Medellinas, um, most court paintings looked kind of like that at best. This is a more modern 1848 court painting of the royal family of Queen Victoria and her consort, and a bunch of inbred babies. Um, they're very cute. I mean, you know, like, you wouldn't guess it. The, the quality's not so good, but it's, it's you know, a very cute picture of kids at play. Very nice. It's pleasant. Can't find anything bad, necessarily. Um, but it is what it is. It's a court painting of the royal family. And Victoria is looking at you. I would say looking down at you. <laughs> um, as the royal monarch who's above the mortals should do in her proper posture. That's you know, a certain air of superiority, and that's, that's the right way that things should be in the royal household, you know? So Velázquez does something interesting, and there's a painting he's very, he's very much famous for called La Meninas, I said Melinas, Me Meninas in 1656, just after the Thirty Years' War ended. Um, can I get my uh, book, Olivier, uh, next to you? Actually, yeah. All right, this is a very same type of subject matter. You're taking the royal family, and this is a painting of the royal family. But he does, he totally inverts this and, and does something very unique. Um, this is probably one of the most revolutionary paintings I've ever seen with my own eyes, ever. I, I have not seen anything that challenges this, because it works on many levels. And here's one thing, I, I post this on Facebook to get people's thoughts on it. And in response, I got a lot of broad, general statements, academic statements about symbolism and what he does and his techniques. But in terms of just practically looking at a painting and thinking about his mind, Velasquez's mind, and what he was planting for you, it was very difficult, I found, for people to do that. Even though some of it does scream loud. So what do you guys, what do you guys think about this painting so far? What do you think the subject matter is? I mean, I sort of said it, but do you see why, why it's, it's ambiguous a little bit? There's a person at the back. There's a person in the back? You also don't see the king and queen directly. 
You don't see the king and queen directly. Yeah, it's supposed to be about the king. The king and queen are supposed to be the subjects, actually. Yeah. You don't see them directly. You can see them in the mirror. You see them in the mirror. You do. Uh -huh. That's true. You do. But it seems that we are the king and the queen. Yeah. <laughs> ah! <laughs> you guys see what, what Patrick just said? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because the Velasquez is look at us. Yeah. Velasquez and he's painting and painting. Uh, and it's an action. Yeah. Velasquez put himself. In that's action. Velasquez. Yeah. And he's, yeah. That's Velasquez right there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and yet, yeah, you're right. And especially when someone is looking at you, and especially the painters, yeah. he said us to you a, a kind of warning. Like uh, Raphael in his uh, school uh, of Athens. Mm -hmm. You look at us. He's looking at you, that's true. He's looking directly at you, it's true. There's right. certain meaning in his eyes. Right. That, that canvas, by the way, is the actual size of the canvas. If you look at it on a wall, it's, it's that big okay. in real life. So he is painting the very painting that he's showcasing. And he's painting well, you it again. It seems that we are a king or a queen. Yeah, yeah. It seems like we are the king. You can see how that could possibly be a revolutionary statement, right? Mm -hmm. And obviously people think it's the royal daughter who's the subject matter. Yeah. Not really the case. Um, he's sort of standing behind her. But yet yeah, it is, right? So it, there's a, there's a built-in playful ambiguity that he's creating where it sort of is her, it sort of is the king and queen. It sort of is himself, right? He is sort of the, the subject too. Yeah. But it's sort of you. And he's doing what Rembrandt does with the anatomy lesson, but he's taking it to another level. Because where Rembrandt is, is destroying this artificial divide between the object and the subject, which you need to do if you're going to be a citizen of the world and make decisions that are going to impact society, you have to yourself feel humanity as a whole. You have to see yourself as part of humanity as a whole. Right? You, and you, you can't see that there's a government that rules me and then there's me in my little world. That's a, a, a little uh, peasant life. You're not going to be able to make the types of spirited decisions that you need to make. So obviously, yeah, this divide of the object-subject has to be relieved. And he does that in Rembrandt's painting. This, it happens here again, but he goes further and he actually transforms the idea of sovereignty. Right? Is it the king and queen who are born as divines who are sovereign from the gods? Or is it all of us who are sovereign? Mm -hmm. And I'd say that there's an additional thing that he plants, which you can't really, most people don't really pick this up, and it's only because of a paper by Pierre Baudry that I, I noticed this. Uh, but these two paintings up here actually say a lot of uh, his intention. You can't really make them out of the, and I think he intentionally made them, uh, he cast them in shade a little bit, uh, because it would have made his intention a little bit too Obvious. clear, yeah. In your face. These are two Rubens paintings. Mm -hmm. One Rubens painting is um, Apollo's victory over Marcius. And the other one, so that's this one. And this one is Minerva punishing Arachne. Now Rubens, he's an interesting guy, um, he himself is, is, is Dutch, but um, a lot of his paintings portray a very, very uh, critical view of the gods. And in, in the case of, of Minerva punishing Arachne, who is also portrayed as Pallas, Pallas, it's not the best version of Pallas that's out there, this one's a little bit more mean. Um, she's beating Arachne because Arachne was a weaver and they had a competition to see who could weave the best, most beautiful uh, carp, uh, drapery. And Arachne's drapery featured all these different elements critical of the gods and exposing the, the different crimes of the gods, but it was beautiful, and she won the competition. And this god, uh, Minerva, couldn't take the loss, or her ego wouldn't permit that somebody lower would, would win in a competition, and she punished her by transforming her into a spider, <coughs> you know, on the top of ceilings, just watching humanity fly by. Mm. That's where the word arachne comes from, and it's, it's from Ovid's Metamorphosis. And the other one is um, another story of, of, a, of a competition between the gods. You have Apollo, and, uh, and Marcius is the inventor of a, of, a of a particular flute. And Apollo plays his instrument. I forget what instrument it is. I think it's a, a lute. No, it's not a lute. Harp. Huh? Harp. 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 Yeah. And uh, he loses the competition. 
And he changed the rules. He says, no, I'm not going to let somebody lower than me beat me to God in uh, any competition, especially one conveying beauty. And he changed the rules and says, you have to play two, two different voices at the same time and play it backwards. And, you know, uh, Marcius just can't do it. It's not physically possible. And as punishment for him losing and uh, affronting his ego, he flays him and tortures him. Flays him meaning, like, cuts off his skin and it's, it's a great diet. So he gets pretty straight, brutal commentaries on the nature of those who believe themselves immortal and, and born to divine births, which the problem with monarchies and the divine right of kings anyway, right? Because mm -hmm. what gives these, these people in their blood more right to rule than the common man and woman? Isn't it a bit risky to paint that? Super risky. Luckily, Philip IV wasn't a super smart guy, and, and he loved, like, he really, really liked Velasquez his whole life. He's the court painter, like the highest painter of the court. Yeah. And uh, and so he's basically mocking him. In his he's face. bold. He's really bold. Now, unfortunately, Velasquez intended for this to be seen by the mass audience, but it was locked away. I think some of Aww. the king's advisors were smarter than the king was and realized what the implications were, and they made sure that this was going to be locked up in the inner courts. Aww. And it was only, I think, in the early 1800s. The that king he, was probably, oh, you painted my daughter, how nice. Yeah, he thought there was like yeah. a clever, you know, he's being like, just clever, right? Mm -hmm. What a unique way of painting a king and queen in my family. <laughs> he, he liked that. Um, but so they, they made sure that nobody could see this for like over 200 years. It was only in the 1800s that it was made public. Mm -hmm. right? it, was that, it was that potent. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so. Now, there's other things too in here, but I think those are the core uh, concepts to get across. Okay, here, so let me just cut to the chase. Um, so Schiller says, Ten minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Schiller says here, in the beautiful, <clears throat> reason and sensuousness harmonize, and only on account of this harmony does it have attractiveness for us. Through beauty alone would we therefore eternally never learn that we are determined and able to prove ourselves as pure intelligences. In the sublime, on the contrary, reason and sensuousness do not harmonize, and precisely in this contradiction between both lies the charm where, wherewith it seizes our soul. And what he's saying is that if you just have beauty by itself, it's not enough. You could easily get just enwrapped into beauty and not want to think anymore, right? Mm -hmm. um, so beauty by itself on a simple sensual level is not adequate. You need to have something that juxtaposes it and reminds us of something greater. Um, there's a, a not so beautiful painting, but a powerful one, which I think gets at that, of Rembrandt's Prodigal Son Returns, which I wanted to show you guys. Um, it's, I think, completely beautiful and better than a, this, a, a lot of other renditions of the same subject, which we're not going to dwell on. I think if, in some ways, physically speaking, this has more beauty to it, more, uh, you know, sensual um, realism. But this one is infinitely superior. And it's infinitely superior because you're dealing with somebody who's completely disheveled, lacking a shoe, has been, or, you know, has completely abused himself taking his, his father's fortune, running off into the world, wasting it all away, gambling, drinking, uh, fornication, you name it, and he basically came back a failure. And the father, rather than doing what you would think a father would do with a humiliated son who should be embarrassed that he just like wasted his fortune, doesn't do what, what his animal instincts would impel him to do, which is slap the freaking son and, and send him away or something. But he completely welcomes him in and he has a feast. And his other son, who, who was the good son, said, why, you've never made a feast for me? He's like, yeah, but <laughs> I never lost you. You never were found again. Um, you never needed to be found again. Whereas my, my other, your, your brother, has actually um, refound his, 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 his path and is asking for forgiveness, and we're going to welcome him back in. And it's a beautiful sentiment that's being expressed, the forgiveness. This one completely lacks it. It's just the, the father's just looking almost disappointed at the son who's like asking to, you know, it's have a bed again. Baby. Yeah, kind of just begging it. It's just, there's no, no, no spirituality there. Um, we're going to skip that statement. Here's a, no, I can't skip it. Read this, look at the last painting, then we'll stop. All right, the feeling of the sublime is a mixed feeling. It is a combination of woefulness, which expresses itself in the highest degree as a shudder, and of joyfulness, which can rise up to enrapture 
and although it is not properly pleasure, is yet widely preferred to every pleasure by fine souls. The union of two contradictory sentiments in a single feeling proves our moral independence in an irrefutable manner. For as it is absolutely impossible that the same objects stand in two opposite relations to us, so does it follow therefrom that we ourselves stand in two different relations to the object, so that consequently two opposite natures must be united in us, which are interested in the conception of the same in completely opposite ways. We therefore experience through the feeling of the sublime that the state of our mind does not necessarily conform to the state of the senses, that the laws of nature are not necessarily also those of ours, and that we have in us an independent principle, which is independent of all sensuous emotions. And the final painting I do want to present, because that's a lot that he's getting at with this idea of the sublime, which he writes papers on, and I'll email a few out to, to really flush through, but it's an important concept, is that it's, 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 it's a pleasure, but it's more than a pleasure. It's not just your average, average pleasure, right? It's more pleasurable to find, to souls who have developed and matured themselves, that this is more appreciated than regular, you know, pleasures on a lower level. And it's the union of two contradictory sentiments and a single feeling. And I, and I picked here a painting, uh, again, by a, a study by, by Pierre Baudry, who, uh, who develops this quite a bit, uh, by a Russian painter named Ilya Rapin. And this is a painting of, it was painted actually not, not 1889, as it says, in, in 1893, and it's Ivan the Terrible at the moment that he's just realized that he's killed his son, the heir to the throne of Russia. And that's a pretty scary, I mean, that's a gory painting. Everything is disheveled, chairs are knocked down, but I would say that this is sublime. But it's not sublime for the obvious reasons. Do, do other people see that this is sublime, or do they see this more as like gory and kind of like creepy? No, creepy. there's, there's an uh, intimacy there. There's an intimacy. Which reminds me also of the painting with the sculpture, I think, by Michelangelo. I think it's uh, Mary holding Jesus, and like, yeah, it's almost like uh, he's, he's dying. And the difference with this one, though, if you look into his eyes, Mary's sad, he just killed his own son. Mm. And he just realized that he did that. Right. Oh, I see. Right. Mm. Different story. Okay, right. yeah. Not so intimate. No. <laughs> it's more like shocked. And, yeah, yeah, that blood is gushing and that gut. Yeah. The sun is, is, doesn't have much longer blood. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like the carpet is ripped, like, saying that it's full of blood. Yeah, that could be symbolic for that, too. Definitely missed. It. I mean, I, I'm the terrible, being a king, with all of the different paranoid impulses that tend to arise when you, divide, when you define your identity around your status and your divine right of kings. A lot of paranoia can tend to blossom. Um, he saw his own son as a threat to himself. He, he made his son's life hell. He sent two of his son's wives away to convents just to drive his son mad as revenge. Um, his third, the son's third wife, he ended up like punching and causing her miscarriage. Um, and the son, when he confronted his father for having killed his, his child and, while he was, he was gestating, the, the father, the, Ivan the Terrible, as the story goes at least, accused his son of rebellion against the father and uh, hit him with a, with a big brass object and he died a few days later. Now what makes this sublime, I think, it, is this certain quality that you probably can't see very well from the positions you're all in, but if you get down to the son's face, there's a tear. And that tear says a lot. It changes the character of, of everything happening. Because if you just got killed by your, your, your unjust father, right? you're a young man, you could lead the kingdom, you had a, a lot of potential to do a lot of good, and your father just did this to you, what emotions would you feel? What would be the lawful feelings that you would have inside yourself, knowing that you were about to die and this terrible person did this to you? Anger and hate. Anger and hate? Yeah. yeah. Fear, anger, hate. Yeah. Right. There's also this feeling that we, both of them, they understand. They, like um, the the son maybe understood why his father hit him, uh, and his father and he understands that his father is also in, in, is awestruck by his own actions. 
so there is a certain commonality that brings them together. There's, there's something that there's definitely I there's definitely a certain sense of forgiveness from the son. Yeah. And if the father wasn't so horrified, I don't think that the son would have that within him. Um, and by the way, I didn't grasp uh, everything in, about the history, but in the Russian, when Ripin presented this painting, it was just about a revolution because mm -hmm. of this painting. Mm -hmm. People will revolt because of two factions, mm -hmm. the faction of the father and the faction of the son. And if he didn't paint this little tear, mm -hmm. the whole Russia broke up because of this painting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. I would like to know more about that. Mm -hmm. huh. So I, I know he did this on the anniversary of the assassination of Tsar Alexander II. But um, I don't grasp all things I have to study. So Alexander II was also, I, I'd like to know more, but Alexander II was also a friend of, of Lincoln, who saved America in the Civil War and was known himself as the great liberator who freed the, the serfs. And when he was uh, killed by an operation run from London, the same type of operation that killed Lincoln, um, there was an homage paid to him, and, and this is how Willie European also was thinking when he painted this. And that was the form. He died in, in 1889, and the Tsar, uh, Tsar's son died in 1589. So there's this historic moment there, too. It, I guess there's somebody I could hear chewing or something on the Google Hangouts. I'm not sure what's going on. It's kind of weird. Might be Sky. <clears throat> so, I guess with the, to end this, the last quote I, I think I would like to read. There were a few more paintings, but I think the. The painting, or the, the quote that I think I'd like to leave off on. Yeah. Yeah, this is good. So Schiller again on the sublime, a little bit more in depth, where he says, because the frightful subject matter acts upon our sens sensuous nature more forcefully than the infinite one. The infinite being the abstract concepts, right? Mm -hmm. So there's something in a visceral, frightening moment which acts on us which an abstract idea couldn't. So because it acts on this, our sensuous nature more forcefully, so the gap between the sensuous and the transcendental capability is also felt all the more ardently. So the superiority of reason and the inner freedom of the heart become all the more prominent. That the entire essence of the sublime is founded on this, our rational freedom, and all delight in the sublime is grounded directly on this consciousness alone. So it follows that the, fright, the frightful must needs touch the aesthetical imagination more ardently and pleasantly than the infinite, and that therefore the practical sublime takes a very great priority over the theoretical in strength of feeling. Mm -hmm. And as sort of a, a, a segue to a, a follow-up class, this can be done in landscapes too. Mm -hmm. And there was an entire school of painting that blossomed in America around Alexander von Humboldt's uh, writings and Schiller's writings called the Hudson River School. And this is one of those paintings that I think express the sublime, where the idea of the whole school was to find in nature the sublime and, and use that to guide not just painting trees and mountains to make beautiful landscapes, but to paint something more spiritual underlying uh, the landscape that you see which has this broader philosophical concept behind it. And I think that this is a really great one by, by I was going to say Thomas Cole, Frederick Church, um, which was painted during the Civil War in America, where America's fate was not very well understood. And a lot of the Hudson River artists painted a very specific type of, of, of painting during the Civil War that embodied a metaphor of, of danger with hope. And I guess you guys can probably see where the sensuous instinct is being threatened in this, mm -hmm. and where the higher intellectual instinct is also being given hope. I don't know if you guys see what, what's going on. The, the, the image is bad, but you see it's a volcano, right? Yeah. So you've got a very beautiful landscape, but where's the hope? I mean, that, that, that's a very destructive uh, volcano. It's going to kill a lot of things around it. But where's a higher, a higher fire, a higher power emerging in that painting? The sun? The sun is rising. Mm -hmm. right? You've got an idea of a, of a higher, um, more powerful, but yet harder to see or harder to appreciate phenomenon mm -hmm. juxtaposed with this like sensual, you know, 
Well, maybe you know. we're looking to the West. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> and so the sun is the setting. Sun is setting? Yeah. That would totally change the tone. And actually, William brought this up. Uh, we, were, we were talking about this painting a while ago, or a few days ago, and William was like, well, I, I think that uh, uh, church is actually, he, he became really um, pessimistic in his, in his later years because of this painting. And uh, <laughs> it's like, why? I, I, was, I love this painting. It's like, yeah, but the sun is setting. It's like, wait a minute, <laughs> that would totally change everything. <laughs> and if that were true, it, yeah, that would be a very kind of depressing statement. But if you actually look at everything that that church did after this, before this, and just this, mm -hmm. all his life's work, he's not that character. He wouldn't want to demoralize you. Um, so we're looking at these. You must be looking at these. Well, Thank maybe God. if this place actually <laughs> exists, we would know. I wonder if he's leaving uh, ambiguity intentionally. Can you hear me? Yeah. Maybe he is. Maybe there's a statement of possible danger of the Civil War, and we don't know how it's going to end. That's yeah. not true. Yeah, if you took a snapshot of the Civil War, all you see is destruction, but there's like a beautiful potential there. But that could also be a sunset or a sunrise, really. Yeah. In the middle. Good point. Olivier also had a thought that was finished. Yeah, the robot controlling the library. What was that, Olivier? I said if this place actually exists, so the river and the mountain in the back, well, yeah. maybe we know if we're looking to the east. So you don't think this is a real place? It is a real place. It's actually a, a oh, God, I just, I'm blanking on the memory of the title. William, help me. Are you still there? Will, one more time. Cotopaxi. Thank you. Wow, I totally had a, a break. That's where? Cotopaxi is in Ecuador, I believe. Oh, it's not you in the United States. No, Alexander von Humboldt, uh, he spent many years, about five years, uh, exploring South America. And uh, his works revolutionized natural science, and he brought also a, a whole study on physical economy, how, how to improve nature as well as understand it. Or through understanding, you have the power to improve it as well, so that's his view. You don't just impose yourself on nature, but you enhance the laws you discover of nature. So he worked on dams and, and things like that. And when he came back to America, he was made part of the uh, Ben Franklin's Philosophical Society. And uh, it inspired, his works just inspired all of the different Hudson River School artists. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's a follow-up class. So we're going to do that soon. Thank you very much.